Hi, and thank you very much for watching. I would like to give a quick update to those who are watching with me for our soon escape from this world. If you have watched any of my recent videos, you will know that the hatred for those who watch for the Lord's return and look at high watch windows or specific days is at an all-time high. I've never had so many hateful and condescending comments at any time in the past, and it certainly confirms what God's Word says about the times that we live in. So if you are someone who gets upset when those who cannot wait to meet their Lord and Savior speculate about specific dates on which this wonderful reunion could occur, knowing that they could be wrong, then this video is probably not for you. I do not want to upset you, but there are many, including myself, who are strengthened to endure a little longer in this world when they have a date in the future to focus on. If that date passes and nothing happens, then we feel disappointed for a few days perhaps, but it certainly does not affect our faith. God's word promises the crown of righteousness to all those who eagerly watch for our Lord's return and who love His appearing when the day finally arrives. It is perhaps the easiest crown to obtain, but it certainly comes with severe persecution from both the world and fellow Christians. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. To those who say, but you said it would definitely happen on a specific day, please watch the series that I pointed to in every one of the recent videos where I provide details on my understanding of world events that align with Bible prophecy. And note that I declare more than once that I am fallible and that my understanding could be wrong. Even in today's video, I will share new insights with those who are interested and do understand that we only see through a glass darkly, but that as we get closer to the day, we can see it more clearly and if we are wrong, we simply move on and keep watching. Also, several viewers have stated that my intent with the videos that I post is to make money. When I started this channel, our Heavenly Father very clearly told me that I am not to monetize this channel and I have never received any money from YouTube for any of the videos I have put out. In fact, because this channel is not monetized, YouTube is intentionally unsubscribing people from it without them knowing it because a channel that is not monetized is not good business for them. If you see ads on the videos that I publish, they are placed there by other channels that allow me to reuse some of their material. The PayPal link that I provide in the description of the videos and on my channel's homepage is simply there for those who have asked me for a way in which they can support the work that I do. I make these videos because we are really close to the time of the rapture and my desire is to have as many as would heed the warnings to be in a position to escape the horrors that are about to be unleashed on this world. I am making these videos because our Heavenly Father loves you and wants you to be ready for the soon coming marriage. I do it because the Lord has called me to watch for His return and to share what He shows me with those who have ears to hear, knowing that I am just as fallible as anyone else. I hope this addresses some of the false accusations that I've seen in the comments of recent videos. Okay, so with that said, on to today's video. Having the benefit of hindsight, when we consider what was said in part 3 of the series, we looked at the repeating model that was provided by Gabriel concerning two announcements through which Jesus' visitations are prophesied. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. In Daniel 9, we note that there is a single event that marked the start of the countdown to the Messiah's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And this was Artaxerxes' decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Applying this pattern to Daniel 12 and knowing what happened over the past three years, we know exactly when another decree was issued that ended normal daily life as stated in Daniel 12. The day on which a global pandemic was declared has now also become known as the day everything changed and where normal daily life ended just as prophesied in Daniel 12. 
However, in Daniel 12, the starting point of the 1290 days is not marked by a single event as in the case of Daniel 9. And this is where my interpretation was incorrect. There are in fact two conditions mentioned that need to be satisfied for the countdown to commence. The first is easy to identify as the decree by the WHO was made on March 11th, 2020. But the second aspect is a little more ambiguous as we do not know exactly what God would consider the completion of the setup of the abomination that causes desolation. We know that the process with which the abomination was introduced into people's bodies started only five days after the decree was made on March 16th. This marks the start of the process through which the abomination that causes desolation would be set up. But this passage does not provide us with sufficient information to know when this setup would be complete. For that, we have to search the scriptures to find our answers. And fortunately, we know that the Bible can answer any question related to Bible prophecy if we search diligently. In part 2 of the series, we looked at this timeline in which I explained how the 1290 days mentioned in Daniel 12 represent the beginning of God's judgment over His church. And this specifically mentioned in verse 10 of Daniel 12, which is of course also connected to 1 Peter 4 verse 17. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? In Matthew 24, Jesus refers to this period as the beginning of sorrows, and what we understand from the timeline that we have previously constructed, with the understanding that some of the dates will have to move out slightly, is that there are three groups that will each endure their own period of tribulation, and the intensity of the tribulation getting worse for each successive group. Tribulation started with God's church, which has been tested to see if they would stay true to the word of God, or choose to bow to the evil and deceptive systems of this world. This will be followed by a more severe period of tribulation for the testing of the unbelievers, and those of God's church who failed the first test, and it is mind-boggling that there are many Christians today who even desire to be part of the second group. Finally, we have God's wrath poured out over the wicked, or those who have worshipped the Antichrist and who have taken his mark, and this happens while Israel is protected in the wilderness for 1260 days. Now in Matthew 24, Jesus provides details concerning the end of a period of tribulation, and since there are three of these periods, the onus is on us to use the word of God to understand which of the three he is referring to. We have to be diligent and we cannot base our understanding on mere assumptions. Let us consider what exactly Jesus said. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. There are several aspects mentioned in this passage that tell us exactly which period of tribulation Jesus is referring to. But first, we have to link Matthew 24 to a passage that clearly describes the intent of Jesus' coming with clouds, which is found in Revelation 14, where the ingathering of God's elect is described in a little more detail, and additional context is provided. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. 
When Jesus comes with clouds, his purpose is to reap his harvest and to collect that which belongs to him. This is confirmed in Matthew 24 where we see the angels being sent out to collect Jesus' elect. We know that the harvest process also involves leaving behind the corners of the harvest or the gleanings to the poor and the stranger, if we remember what is shown to us in the harvest and temple models. Considering the end of the passage in Matthew 24, the events that are described can only be positioned at the point of transition between the judgment of the church and the judgment of the unbelievers. If this passage pointed to events that occurred after the judgment of unbelievers or after the judgment of the wicked, the angels would find no one to collect from the four winds of the earth, as there would be no believer alive on the earth at either of these points, and all who have laid down their lives for Jesus during the second period gather under the altar in heaven, where they have to wait until their full number is reached. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. If Jesus was pointing to his second coming in Matthew 24, which occurs at the end of the unbeliever's tribulation, he would have described this event with him riding a white horse and having a two-edged sword proceeding from his mouth, not coming on the clouds. Those who await the end of the period known as the beginning of sorrows expect to meet their Savior in the clouds, and this meeting is announced with the sound of a trumpet that will see the dead in Christ raised back to life, and caught up together with those who are still alive and who belong to Christ. So from a biblical perspective, it is clear that Jesus is referring to the end of the period that is known as the beginning of sorrows, when he says, after the tribulation of those days. So what does this tell us and what additional information can we glean from this that we missed in Daniel 12 verse 11? Given that we are uncertain about the exact starting point of the 1290 days mentioned in Daniel 12, and which is assigned to the period known as the beginning of sorrows, we are given extra detail to consider regarding the end of this period. Jesus said that immediately after this time of tribulation, the sun would be darkened and the moon would not give her light, which means that the end of the 1290 day period is associated with two heavenly signs. Now considering everything that we have been through during the past three years, and given the number of Bible prophecies that we have seen being fulfilled before our eyes, we have a good approximation of where the 1290 day period started, although we cannot pinpoint the exact date. We do know that we are now right at the end of that period. It is like seeing an aircraft coming in for a landing, with the aircraft already over the runway. The only thing we are waiting for is the exact moment where those wheels make contact with the tarmac. Jesus provides us with the missing detail we require to correctly position the 1290 day period, when he says that immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give her light. A sequence of two heavenly signs, exactly as mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24, is scheduled for the second half of October, with an annular solar eclipse occurring on October 14th and a partial lunar eclipse occurring on October 29th. Does this mean that the trumpet that is mentioned in Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 and 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 could be sounded before the onset of these signs? From what we read in Matthew 24, it is certainly possible, but we also have to consider what is shared in Psalm 104, where we read something very specific that is associated with these signs that are first mentioned in Genesis 1. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun doeth his going down. In Psalm 104, we are specifically told that the moon is given to mark his appointed times. 
And as such, we have to be open to the possibility that if the solar eclipse passes uneventfully, the partial lunar eclipse may, according to God's word, be marking the appointed time at which the 1290 day period will end. I believe our Heavenly Father knew that we would look at March 11th as a starting point for the 1290 day period, which certainly does not satisfy the conditions as stated in Daniel 12 verse 11, and has given us comforting words to encourage us as we continue to wait for this period to come to an end. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. If Psalm 104 tells us that God uses the moon specifically to mark his appointed times, or the Moedim, and that the vision that tarries even though it does not tarry will come at an appointed time, it stands to reason that our focus should be on the upcoming lunar eclipse, which would seem to be the chosen marker that points us to our bridegroom's return on the clouds. This is further emphasized in Proverbs 7. For the good man is not at home, he has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. So if you have been feeling disappointed after seeing September pass us by, do not lose hope. Even though we can only approximate the starting point of the 1290 day period, Jesus tells us that the two heavenly markers will occur in a specific order, immediately after the period known as the beginning of sorrows ends. And if we are concerned about our understanding possibly being wrong, and this period possibly extending into the following year, the eclipses that occur in 2024 do not occur in the order that Jesus described. So we know that we have an end of October deadline, with the possibility of seeing our blessed hope as early as on or shortly before October 14th. Do you not find it amazing that the closer we get to our blessed hope, the more detail we discover that points us to the day of our redemption? I hope this information will bless you and encourage you as we continue to watch. Remember, I am fallible and my understanding could still be wrong, but I will keep watching until the day that we fall down before the feet of our bridegroom, and I hope you will endure with me until we do. If you want me to do a video that focuses on the enemy's predictive programming regarding the time between September 23rd and October 31st, let me know in the comments and I will consider making one before October 14th. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless.